All right, welcome back, everyone. Thanks so much for joining this second episode of After the Blog. This episode is about the blog post entitled Azure OpenAI Content Filtering and Abuse Monitoring with Microsoft Sentinel. All right, so there were a couple of open-ended questions in that blog post. And I have to kind of admit that they were on purpose because I wanted to add some additional context a little bit later on. I thought it might be a blog, but I thought this might be actually a better opportunity to do another episode of After the Blog. And in doing so, the two things that I kind of left open-ended, <clears throat> I thought best to invite a good colleague of mine, good friend of mine, um, as a guest to help bring some clarity and discussion around both of these topics. All right. So I have with me today, Richard Diver. Richard, what do you do at Microsoft? Hey, Rob, thank you. Um, so what do I do? I am a, a technical architect in marketing. It's probably the best way to put it. So I get to talk to all of our engineering and product teams and find out the great stories they have about what they're building next and what they're doing. And then I also get to work on the marketing side where I get to bring those stories to life. So I am a story designer. So at some point, you'll change your name to Disney is what I'm hearing. Richard Disney Dyer. <laughs> Disney, Pixar. Yeah. yeah something that would like be that. good. Well, and, and you're, you're a bit modest, I have to say, um, because as we start to get a couple of topics I want to cover today, I think people will realize. So as, as deep as I am in the security of AI or securing of AI or AI, whatever you want to call this thing that we're trying to accomplish here, as deep as I am, you're like 10 levels deeper than I am because you're like constantly working with this stuff. It's in, it's, it's part of your brain load every day, right? I'm actually trying to work out what it's going to look like in six to 12 months time. And it's, it's not easy. I'll tell you, but it's a lot of fun to try to be at the front end of something. And you know what? I don't yeah. think we'll really know what it's going to become until more people get their hands on it and we see what they do with it. And then you hope everything you designed and planned beforehand stays up. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be, we'll be fine. It'll all be fine. Uh, yeah. Um, well, and, it, and it's constantly evolving. I, I have to, um, I have to say that, that, <clears throat> This blog post in particular, there's pieces of this that we'll talk about <clears throat> where I um, I knew what the answer was two weeks before I wrote this blog post. But what I wanted to do, because you are all things 10 levels deep of securing AI, I had to reach out to you to say, hey, is this still the case? Because it is evolving and moving so quickly. So right. two weeks ago, I'm thinking, uh, before I write this, I better make sure. Yeah, and we're also trying to think about the non-Microsoft angle. So there's always the AI that Microsoft's building and doing what we know about. But we also have to put it into context of you're not just going to use one thing from one company. It's going to it's got to be ubiquitous across the industry. So we're trying to think about how to how to talk about concepts that may not exist today um, and see how others will also talk about it. Right. Yeah. That is correct. So I, <clears throat> I have two topics I want to cover today. Right. So these blog posts are quick to the point. Um, I'm just going to go ahead, and go back to this blog post that I wrote and I'll send everyone links back to the show notes. But there's this one spot. It says this. Sometimes I can't believe the things that I write. They're awesome. Um, Microsoft Sentinel, of course, is a powerful tool for capturing and analyzing logs. And while its intent is to analyze for security value, it can be used to analyze and report anything as long as it exists in the log data. Personally, I recommend against using it for anything but security. There are reasons, good ones, but something to cover in another topic. So I wanted to kind of leave that laying out there a little bit. I thought maybe, again, I might do a blog post about it. You do blog posts sometimes, it sounds a little bit preachy. It's almost like you put it in black and white. You're like saying this is definitive. Yeah. And that's another reason, Richard, why I wanted to bring you on. As much as we've talked about securing AI, I don't think a lot of people realize, or maybe more people realize than I even think, but you were one of the original authors on the very first Microsoft Sentinel book ever created, right? Yeah, it was fun. That was great. With well, the, I think, I think you team. might have some, yeah, I think you might have some perception or some ideas around that's, us. That's where, yeah, again, when we wrote that, Sentinel was brand new to the world, and you were trying to think about what is what does a true cloud-based sin mean to the world that only understands what a 
server-based sim is and i think that's the question you're getting to right now is yeah. just because it's a great tool for doing security and it can do some other stuff like if you know how to write kql queries and you know how to put data into a database and you can normalize the data you can set up alerts and automation you could do a lot of things with it but it wasn't designed to do that so tread carefully i think if you have uh, either limited resources and you want to use fewer tools it'd be very tempting to use a single tool to do everything because it's just easier but i think from a cost perspective depending on the volumes you're talking about it's not security tools are not the best way to do a lot of jobs because they're very tuned for security purposes so the data lake is a thing we've definitely seen that trend happen since sentinel stepped into the market that um, now that we have taken away or kind of extracted the the workload of the server processing data and creating analysis and even doing SOAR versus the data collection and storage piece, once you separate those out, the data needs to become a data lake. It just needs to become a huge volume of massive amounts of data that's available when you need it at the lowest, cheapest price you can get. And then there's somewhere in between where real-time data that needs to be uh, analyzed in action now versus data I might need to go back and look at because something happened and I just want to see how long that's been going on for. I want to see how far in the past I can go. Uh, it's useful to have it, but again, it's not always useful uh, in the immediacy. So should a SOC use Sentinel only for security purposes? That's a really good general rule of thumb, but it's always, it depends, right? Well, and 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 I don't want to step on people. Well, maybe I do I want to step on people's toes. Um, uh, so, I've seen a number of customers and, and, and I kind of, I refer to this as a legacy mindset for mm -hmm. security because in, in the old days, before you had some centralized cloud-based cloud powered seam like Microsoft Sentinel, you generally had to collect everything from everywhere, everything, all the data. And, and it was okay to kind of mm -hmm. store that data because you were storing it on-prem or in your data center. More you kind of had control over yeah. the cost. You didn't really yeah. have control over costs, but a lot of not too many tech people are bean counters. They don't monitor, you know, they don't factor in the electricity costs and stuff like that for moving data. Um, but it is kind of a legacy mindset where you just literally want everything. And, and part of that everything was PII data, which they didn't realize it was. Yeah. It was yeah. stats and metrics, things that were just literally unnecessary. It's collecting it but never using it. Because you don't, I think it's always been that fear of I don't know if I'm going to need it or not. But if I don't have it, I can't look at it. So if I collect it, at least I have it. And that's, it's a, it's kind of a safety blanket approach to um, hoarding. You know, if you've ever, yeah. I've done a lot of relocations around the world and put my life in a shipping container and shipped it halfway across the world. And and after a while, you realize I really don't need this stuff. It's nice yeah. to collect it. It's nice to have it around. But <laughs> if you have to actually move it and, and like a, I suppose it's like a, a as I migrate from around the world, you can migrate from one service to another. The more you try to move from one place to another, the harder it is. So data is try to keep the data where it is and look at it where it is. That's kind of what came out of the whole migrating to Sentinel was rethink security. And yeah. you want the logs to be on the endpoint and you want an endpoint system that looks at the logs on the endpoint, but you still need a SIM in the middle that's collecting and gathering the insights and the, the knowledge from all those different systems. It itself might not necessarily need to collect the actual logs anymore because that, that's already been looked at by something else, the smart systems like a endpoint detection or something else. So uh, that kind of leads into where we're heading next in, in AI is what is the right data to collect? And well, right data to, to collect. collect. Yeah, and maybe that's a discussion for another time because I'm uh, still kind of working on that. But at the same time, <laughs> yeah. as part of this, this blog, um, I wanted to kind of highlight the content filtering and because the original question that created or the idea behind this blog, we've had a number of customers that have asked because Sentinel is so powerful and it can collect data literally from anywhere. It can analyze that data and produce reports and alerts and things like this. Can it do content filtering and abuse monitoring? So number one, we already answered the question. It probably can, but it, sh but you shouldn't use it for that. And then number two, um, is content filtering abuse monitoring really part of cybersecurity? How do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, it didn't used to be as much, but um, this is where the world depends on if you're in a hardcore world of I only do A and someone else does B and we're done. But as, as security worlds blur, 
knowing what a user is doing on a system is absolutely a security function. The way you find out what they're doing on a system is changing. It used to be look at the logs and see what they did. Now it's like, what do I think they're going to do next? <laughs> so if you look at um, abuse monitoring, if you understand uh, AI and ChatGPT and other models are available if you want to use them, when you start playing with them, you start to realize they're really powerful and useful. And then you start to see what other people do with them and they start to uh, abuse them. It's the only nice way to call it. They're abusing the AI and trying to see what they can trick it into doing. And there's a lot of ways of doing it and they're very creative. Um, and so what happens is uh, you realize that's that's just a fundamental uh, vulnerability of the system. And so you protect it. So you put abuse monitoring and filtering in place to prevent bad input. Um, but the use of AI in a corporate setting isn't the same as a use of AI in just a free for all. Like, hey, everyone can go use G chat GPT and see how good it is. But once it's in your corporate environment running on your data, you're in control. Like you get to say what people do and don't do with your AI system because that leads to what they can or can't do with the data. So um, content filtering and abuse monitoring as part of an AI system is a critical component that security needs to understand. What are the controls available to them and what should they be doing? Um, but leading into that thing, like I just said, is like, there's some PII in there, people talking to their AIs, like searching the web. Right. The, and do you want your security or, people to have access, <laughs> immediate access to that yeah. PII data or your Same like data. data? Should they have access to the financial records of the whole company? No, they need to protect the financial system, but they shouldn't be reading the financial data. And right. that's the problem with AI is how do you protect how do you protect the system when the system is the data? So it really sounds to me like you need a separate system just for that, right? Not not your standard run of the mill, run of the mill is probably a bad word, but standard security tools, right? It's not logging. Yeah, I don't think it's yeah. going to be a case of let's get the logs and put the logs in Sentinel and create some KQL queries. I don't, that, it's not the only answer. It's probably going to be part of the answer, but um, yeah, there's, there's going to be a growing maturity in uh, understanding how we're going to secure an AI system. And I think that's that's the questions that on the tip of everyone's tongue right now is if whether you're building it yourself or you're buying a co-pilot solution that's built in for you and it's a more of like a SaaS product, there's going to be a different options available to you. So um, yeah, get ready for the future of being an AI architect. You know, I was thinking with something you said just a little bit earlier, um, maybe as a tip for moving internationally, maybe you should just live in the storage container instead of just it's not a bad idea. It's like a mobile home, but that they can go on ships. Yeah. That way, you don't have to worry about all that unnecessary, th all those unnecessary things or that unnecessary data. So, if they build it like the TARDIS and it could expand, that'd be great. But otherwise, it's a bit uncomfortable. Living oh, that would that would bonds. be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then, then we'd be on to our next job. Yeah. Securing the TARDIS. Highly mobile, right? Okay. Well, thanks, Richard. I appreciate it. Anything oh, else? Thank you. Add? Anything else you want to add? No, let's uh, keep an eye on this. I'll keep watching the blogs. Let's see what comes up next. Um, I think the next three to six months is an extremely interesting time to see what comes out and what people do. And uh, we'll be searching for answers and come back and listen to, to more ideas later. I'll have to get yeah, the feedback. Awesome. Well, I'm positive you'll be back because yeah. I do dig into this stuff quite often. And, and again, I consider you the expert. So. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Talk to you next episode.